Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Well, before we do get started, I want to let you know that today's program is brought to you by the financial support of our listeners. Thank you so much for your support, and I especially want to thank Vance and Linda for their support. Thanks so much. We'll send access to the premium side, as we do with all donations of $7 or more. And you, too, can support the show at support.greatdetectives.net. All right, well, I also want to uh, let you know that going on over at The War, our second week of programs be- begun. Uh, the first two days of this week will focus on an educational series called Americans Look Abroad, which gave, gave some, or America Looks Abroad, which gives some great insight into happenings in the war in 1940. And then in our last three episodes of the week, we take a look at fictional uh, radio taking on the axis, and in particular, some stories from the adventures of Superman, and that's all at thewar.greatdetectives.net. Well, folks, it's time to get into today's episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. It's the Tears of Night Matter, parts one and two. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Uh, this is Hillary Fuchs, CPA. You left word for me to call Mr. Dollar. I don't seem to recall the name. I'm with Universal Adjusters. They asked me to look into this Wendover claim. Universal Adjusters? Insurance Adjusters? That's right, insurance. I understand you filed a claim in Mrs. Wendover's name. Mrs. Wendover hired me to handle her affairs a few days ago. Who do you want to talk to, me or Mrs. Wendover? Anybody who can make me understand why Mrs. Wendover let a $50,000 policy lie around for two years before she filed a claim. I'll try. I don't know whether I can convince you or not, but I'll try. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, 518 Spear Boulevard, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Tears of Night matter. Expense account item one, $92.50, airfare and incidentals, Hartford to Miami Beach, Florida. My plane got in at 11 p.m., so I went to a hotel and got some sleep. I put in a call to Hillary Fuchs, certified public accountant, as soon as I woke up. Then I had some breakfast and took a cab out to his office. It was a pleasant four-mile trip along a beautiful white-sanded oceanfront, and it cost me, Adam, two, three bucks even. Come on in here, Dollar. The air conditioner's working here. Hillary Fuchs was a big man in his late 40s. He was semi-bald, had a good sunburn, and smelled faintly of scotch whiskey. The office he led me into was cool and dark and elegantly furnished in bamboo knickknacks. The desk was cluttered with a stack of financial statements and legal papers. This is quite a thing, I guess, Dollar. By the way, I didn't find any universal insurance adjusters in the phone book. We're located in Hartford, Connecticut. Hartford? You're a long way from home, Dollar. They sent you all the way to Miami Beach about this? Yep. Seems like a pretty expensive way to handle it. Pretty expensive claim, $50,000. Would it do any good to tell you it's legitimate? Sure. But I'm hired to check it out just the same. (laughs) In other words, you don't believe me. Well, look at it our way, Mr. Fuchs. The claim came into the office day before yesterday, and we have 72 hours to act on it. Okay. What can I do? First off, tell me your connection with Mrs. Wendover. She hired me to put her business affairs in order about 10 days ago, first time I ever saw her. She said the Treasury Department had advised her to get some expert help. They were on her about back taxes, and that's it. Oh, I see. Tell me about Noah Wendover's death. He died two years ago, last April 14th. 
By the way, it's just coming to me. Did you people... I mean, did the insurance company know anything about him being dead until that claim came in? No. <laughs> no wonder they sent you all the way from Hartford. Well, uh, Wendover and his wife took a party of eight out on their boat for a ten-day cruise. Wendover had an attack of appendicitis at sea. There wasn't a doctor aboard. The appendix burst, and he died before they could make the nearest port. Mm -hmm. Let me get back to the original question. Why all this time before Mrs. Wendover filed claim for benefits? Well, you really got to know Mrs. Wendover, I guess. She's a little crazy, a little wacky, a little strange. These are your impressions of her? It's a consensus. I asked her around after she came here the other day. The story is that she and Wendover had a pretty good thing in their marriage. They were wild about each other. They spent money like water, and they had plenty of it to spend. Then one day he died. Kind of threw her. Maybe it's still throwing her. I don't know. Sure, sure. Somewhere along the line, in the last year, Mrs. Wendover's met somebody else. Oh? I don't know who he is because I wasn't paying any attention when she mentioned his name. But she's sort of coming out of it, and she's going to marry him. Uh -huh. So she wants to get her business affairs in order. From the look of things, nobody's done much about them since Wendover's death. You see all that stuff on the desk? Yeah, I noticed it. It's all hers. She brought it to me in three big hat boxes. Stocks, bonds, bills, deeds, I don't know what all. I know she's in a little trouble with the government, not because she hasn't got the money to pay them, but just because she hasn't bothered with anything like that. Hmm? Anyhow, one of the first things I came across was the insurance policy thrown in there with all the rest of the stuff. And look, you see these checks? Yeah. Almost $90,000, dividends on some oil stock. Doesn't even bother to open her mail or cash her checks. <laughs> well... A lot of people around the country, including your insurance company, are going to be startled when I finish straightening all this out. I sent the policy claim in as a matter of course. That's my explanation for it being two years late. <laughs> well, that's a pretty good explanation. Look here. She completely forgot she loaned an $8,000 automobile to a friend in Tampa 14 months ago. I asked her about it, and she said she thought she'd left it at the filling station. What? And here... The boat Wendover died on, worth $60,000. She sold it to a fisherman last year for 5000 Yeah, I get the idea, Mr. Fuchs. Yeah. So you filed the insurance claim in her name along with a dozen other matters that should have been taken care of two years ago. Yeah. You play golf? No. Well, I do, and I'm tired of looking at this pile of stuff. Mind if I look at it? Help yourself. All yours. I'll be at the club. Do whatever you have to. By the way, what do you have to do? Verify this death certificate in the coroner's report. Well, then you will honor the claim? I'll file my report, and it's up to the insurance company to do as they see fit. You're kind of cagey, aren't you? Uh, that's why they pay me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, Mr. Fuchs. Yeah? Is there some kind of bank balance in this stuff, current? Well, you'll find it there, but I'll tell you, in cash, Mrs. Wendover's worth about $950,000. I doubt very much if she's trying to cheat the insurance company out of 50000 you can't ever tell, though, can you, Mr. Fuchs? No, nope. can't ever tell. After he left, I got on the telephone and talked to officials about the coroner's autopsy and the death certification on Noah Wendover. They all seemed to be in order. Then I went through the papers on Fuchs' desk. They seemed to be in enough disorder to verify what he told me about Elise Wendover. I left Fuchs' office about 4.30 and went back to my hotel, carrying a picture of a woman who had existed in a state of limbo for two years or more, so far as responsibility and attention to business went. Johnny Dollar. Uh, Hillary Fuchs, can you come over to my office right away? I just left there. What's up? Mrs. Wendover, she's having a fit. Come on over. <laughs> Expense account item three, three more bucks, more cab fare, back to Hillary Fuchs' office. I pulled up in front at exactly 5.30 and noticed a 1956 white Cadillac convertible parked in front. For no reason at all, I took 30 seconds to peek inside. The registration told me the car belonged to Elise Blair Wendover. She had left her purse on the seat and the keys in the ignition. A mink stole was thrown carelessly over the back of the seat. Anybody could have taken the stole, the purse, the car, the whole works. Mrs. Wendover was living up to her advance notices. Come in, come in. Fuchs looked pale and shaken. He fumbled around for a cigarette until I handed him one of mine. He lit it up and tried to get a grip on himself. Mrs. Wendover's in there. Yeah, well, what happened? Well, I had some papers for her to sign, and she dropped in a little while ago. Uh -huh. 
I told her about you. I, I explained to her it was certainly reasonable the insurance company would want to investigate a claim that had been delayed 25 months. Well? She blew up, got kind of hysterical about it, said she wanted to see you right away, that she had something to tell you. Go easy on her, will you? Well, why do you say that? Oh, it's just that... Well, if I'm wrong about her, I'm glad, but I don't think I'm wrong when I say she's right on the edge, just on the edge of it. Feeling better, Mrs. Wendover? The pale girl with the coal black hair, seated stiffly in the chair in front of Hillary Fuchs' desk, was not feeling better. She could have been 16 or 36. It depended on where you were standing when you looked at her. She had a mouth that was too full, shoulders too wide for the strapless sundress, a pair of sandals, a clanking costume bracelet, and black eyes, round, big, bright, too bright. This is Mr. Dollar, Mrs. Wendover. I understand you're investigating my husband's death. I'm here to verify the facts so that eastern states can act on your claim. Don't you believe he's dead? Yes. Don't you? Oh, yes. I saw him die. Yes, he's dead. How much money do you owe me? The claim is for $50,000. Will you pay it? Well, I, I presume it will be paid from all I've seen so far. Of course, that part of it's up to the insurance company. Of course. And they have men sitting at desks... Reading reports about claims all day long. Ah, uh, yes. My dad owned an insurance company once, you know. Those men sitting at their desks, even my dad sat at a desk. I wonder something. Would one of those men sitting at one of those desks write, okay, on my claim for Noah's benefits if he knew about me? Uh, sit down, Mrs. Wendover. Maybe you'd like a drink. You have one, Mr. Fuchs, would they? Well, I, I have to be indefinite about that, too, Mrs. Wendover. What would put a question in the mind of an adjuster if he knew about you? I'm indolent, and I'm irresponsible. Mr. Fuchs can tell you that. I'm not quite dependable, am I, Mr. Fuchs? Oh, we're getting straightened out, Mrs. Wendover. And then, of course, that wouldn't make a difference. I mean, not really. A great many irresponsible, indolent, undependable people file claims. There's something else. I'm a curse. Are you? Oh, yes. It's a very bad thing, a curse. People around me, people I love, just seem to die. Why do you think you're a curse? Noah died, and I loved him. And Daddy, I loved him. And my brother Jim, all dead. No one can stay alive around me. I thought I should tell you that. Yeah, well, I appreciate it, Mrs. Wendover. Well, then we don't have anything more to discuss. Goodbye, Mr. Dollar, Mr. Fuchs. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, Johnny, hey, where are you going? I'm going to drive her home. You are right. She's on the edge of something. I can't quite figure it yet. Brother was killed in Korea. Her father died of a heart attack ten years ago. I got that much from the papers on your desk. Lord, where'd she ever get the idea? Oh, that... I don't know. I've heard of things like this happening. I'll phone you later. Right. Wait a minute. I'll drive you home, Mrs. Wendover. Oh, that'll be nice. She smiled brightly, still too brightly, and we drove along. She didn't tell me which way to turn, what direction to go, and I didn't ask her. I liked it that way, no one saying a word. I was listening to something else anyhow, something inside of me, loud like a cannon firing twice a second. It was my heart making all the noise. Oh, it's happened a couple of times before, and it meant trouble coming up. I knew it. My heart never makes a mistake. Mr. Dollar, do you think he'll die too? <laughs> Johnny Dollar. Hillary Fuchs, Dollar. How's Mrs. Wendover? So far, so good. Dollar, can you talk? Yeah, sure. She's in the other room. Do you think she's all right? Mentally, I mean? I think she's all right enough to get by. I think she's scared to death of something or somebody. That business of the curse? Yeah. You know there isn't anything to that. There's something to it for her. She thinks she's somehow responsible for her husband's death, for her father's death, and for her brother's death. On the way here, she mentioned just like that that someone else was going to die. A words to that effect. Who? 
I don't know. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Tears of Night matter. It had started as a routine investigation. A claim filed for $50,000 on the death of Noah Wendover, Miami Beach, Florida. The question, why the two-year delay in making claim? The answer turned out to be interesting. Briefly, it involved a distraught woman who had neglected not only the insurance, but everything else in her life for two years. A woman obsessed with the idea she was a curse. Do you like soda or water? Uh, soda, please. Thanks. Cheers. Good luck. Mm. What's your name again? Johnny Dollar. Oh, yes, that's right. Mr. Fuchs introduced us, didn't he? Do you think he'll be able to straighten out all my business affairs for me? Yes, I think so, Mrs. Wendover. Including the insurance? Including the insurance, yes. Oh. You're worried about the claim, aren't you? <laughs> well, I, I'm paid to worry about it. I'm not so worried now as when I first came to Miami Beach. I think I understand why it took all this time for the claim to be filed. You mean you've met me and you think I'm kind of... You know, not all there or something. Well... I suppose Mr. Fuchs explained how badly I've managed things for the last two years. He showed me how you've let your affairs go to the devil, if that's what you mean. I'm glad you finally turned it all over to him. I think he'll take care of it for you. I behaved rather badly in Mr. Fuchs' office, didn't I? Well, I wouldn't say that. Poor Mr. Fuchs. He was frightened, I think. I don't know what it is, really. I mean... He mentioned that you were in town investigating my claim on Noah's death. I felt I should talk to you. That's why I had him call you. I wanted to tell you about the curse. There's no such thing, you know, Mrs. Wendover. I know. I know. I couldn't have been responsible for Dad's death. It was a heart attack many years ago. I was away at school in New York. And Jim, my brother being killed in Korea, I couldn't have had anything to do with that. And Noah... Oh, I loved him very much. I'm not cursed, am I? No, no, you certainly aren't. All of these deaths around you have been tragic, doubly so, because you seem to have been very fond of the people. But you aren't responsible in any way. I like you. You're very nice. If you have any questions you want to ask me about Noah, I'd be glad to answer them. I really would. I'm all right now. Really, I am. Well, when we left Mr. Fuchs' office, you talked a lot about that curse business. Yes, I'm ashamed. No. Were you still thinking of that when you spoke to me in the car? Did I speak to you in the car? Yes. You know, I can't remember riding in the car at all. I've been standing here talking to you, and I've been wondering all this time how we got here. <sighs> Do you mind if I help myself? No. We drove over together from Hillary Fuchs' office. I drove you here. Oh. Oh. Some things I just blank out. I've talked to a psychiatrist, you know. I mean, I've been under treatment for several months. He says I established a strong pattern when Noah died of shutting things out, of just forcing my mind to become blank. He's trying to help me get over it. What did I say in the car? You said you were cursed and you wondered if he would die. Oh, dear. Who's he? Teddy. Teddy, uh... Teddy Davis. I'm going to marry him when he asks me. Oh. Uh -huh. And I know he will. I love him very much. Well, why do you think Teddy might die? Because of people dying around me that I love. He doesn't believe in the curse, does he? Oh, no. He's something like you, in a way. Nice. He makes me laugh at it. He says it's ridiculous. Because it is. Somehow I feel comforted. Now, look. You marry this fellow the minute he asks you and forget about being cursed and everything else. He'll take care of you. Well, I better go now. Mr. Dollar. Yes? Thank you. I need sometimes very much to talk to someone like you. Thank you. Jay Dollar, 
oracle. Go out and marry so-and-so and live happily ever after. I like the little kiss she gave me. I like the way she squeezed my hand. I like the perfume she was wearing. I like the way the intense, hard brightness had gone out of her black eyes and she was just a nice woman being a woman. I liked all that. What I didn't like was the idea that she could be the other way, believing in the curse and believing she was somehow responsible for people dying. When I left her, I knew that part wasn't ended. I knew it would come back. Come on in, Dollar. I sort of stuck around wondering if you'd come back here. How is she? She's okay now. Fuchs, I'm sending in my report on this policy tonight. I'm recommending they honor it. I've got enough verification. Okay, that's fine. I sure appreciate your help on this, Dollar. Let me buy you dinner. No, no thanks. I'm getting the first plane back to Hartford. Why not wait until tomorrow? You've got a reason, haven't you? Yeah, I guess so. Mrs. Wendover? Oh, I've met people like her before. Don't ask me where or when, but I've seen them. And there isn't anything to a curse, but trouble seems to follow them. Big trouble. My business here is practically finished. I just want to get out and get away. Can I use your office for about an hour? Sure. It's all yours. Dollar, I feel the same way. I spent a half an hour typing up my report on the Wendover claim and another ten minutes on the phone asking for an airplane back to Hartford. They said they'd call me right back and I poured myself some of Fuchs' whiskey and sat down to stare out at the night. Lights burned up and down the white beach. People strolled up and down, looking at the water, holding hands. And I was sitting alone in Hillary Fuchs' office, waiting for a phone call and thinking about a curse. Hi. Hi. Who are you? Anybody else here? No, why? You were kind of late. So do you. What's on your mind? You? Costigo wants to see you right away. I'm supposed to take you over. Whoever Costigan is, tell him he doesn't want me. You don't tell Sam things like that. You know, it's been a long time since I shook in my boots when a skinny hood like you stood around acting tough. If you've got some business with Hillary Fuchs, look him up at his home. This is Fuchs' office. You're behind his desk. You'll do. Now, come on, mister. And don't show me how loud a certified public accountant can growl. I just might swing this thing on your head. <laughs> That's better. You got a hat? No. I know Costigan wants to talk to you, but I'd sure like to belt you on just for the practice. I'm not Hillary Fuchs. Come on, let's go. Hey, yo! You're, you're gonna break my arm! I'd like to, just for the practice. Now then, it's Costigan. Is he the one from Chicago? Uh, Sam's been there. Answer. The Sam Costigan kicked out of Chicago a few years ago? Yeah, yeah. What does he want to see Fuchs about? The Wendover dame... What? Something about the window with him. I don't know what it is. He just wants to see you. Okay, what's your name? Frank Scanlon. Here. You put this thing in your pocket. Pull it out again in front of me and I'll brain you. Now, let's go. Huh? Now I want to see Sam. Well, sure. Sure. Anything you say. I followed Frank Scanlon out of the building to a waiting car. A black packet with side curtains. It was a nice touch for this day and age. But it didn't make much sense. None of it did. It was illogical in the beginning, middle, and end. Most of all, I didn't make much sense. I should have been in my room packing. Instead, I was on my way to see an old-time grifter and hoodlum named Sam Costigan. Because someone had mentioned the name Wendover. You want to smoke? I use my own. Suit yourself, fella. Scanlon was a thin one with sharp, narrowed eyes. Too much padding on the shoulders, too much snap to the brim of his hat, too much point to the toe of his shoes. The thirty-eight had taken away from him and handed back made a considerable bulge in the front of his coat. About six miles out of Miami Beach, he turned off the main highway onto a dirt road. About a mile of that and up ahead, we saw lights. The lights became a fine old colonial mansion, every room aglow. Two or three guards were watching the entrance to the front. They all needed shaves. No one said anything. Yeah? It's me, Feely. Uh, this here is Hillary Fuchs, uh... Sam wants to see him. Morning. in. How are you feeling, Mr. Feely? <laughs> All kinds of punks around nowadays. I wouldn't get frisky with him if I was you. He's a pretty touchy fella. It's so. Yeah. Oh, this way. Come on. He led me into the main foyer, where a hat check girl with a lot of red hair stood ready for the evening's business, which hadn't begun yet. On the right, what had been the dining room of the old house was now a circular bar that could seat 25 or 30. 
To the left in what had been the parlor and library, I counted two crap tables, two roulette tables, and two blackjack stands. Beyond all this, on a screen porch, a five-piece combo made music. A few tables and head waiters stood around looking bored. Scanlon led me upstairs, and we stopped in front of a wide white door marked private. I thought he was going to knock. Instead, he whirled around very quickly and stuck the same old thirty-eight about two inches into my ribs. Now, let's stand steady. Feely! Eddie! You giving you trouble, Frankie? Nah. I, uh... I will, Buster. I'll give you plenty of trouble if you want it. Hear how he talks to me? I'll crack him up a little for you if you like, Frankie. Nah. He got business with Sam right now. We'll take care of our business with him later on. However you say it, Frankie. I just wanted you to remember that. I will. The same way I remember a dirty newspaper story. (laughs) Know something? I'm looking forward to you. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, there is a curse that goes with the Wendover name. Goes wherever it is. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by John Dawson. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Welcome back. Well, the, Johnny, I've never seen Johnny so eager to uh, get out of town. I do also have an idea of where he's coming from. I don't get why he went ahead and gave the loaded gun back to the thug. It seems like he could have emptied the gun and told him, I'll give it to you after I see your boss. But that's just me. I don't have an action-packed expensive account. So we'll see how this uh, works out. Join us on Wednesday for the next part in this series. Well, we do have some listener comments and feedback regarding Johnny Dollar. I'll go ahead and start out with William, uh, who provides a thought on the Silver Blue matter. William writes, I've really been enjoying the Silver Blue serial. One thing that bothers me about the story, though, is uh, whoever does the voice of Lieutenant Garcia, his attempt at Hispanic accent is horrible. It sounds more German than Hispanic. In fact, I'm certain I've heard this actor do German accents on other OTR programs. When I was listening to him interrogate the boy in episode four, I expected him to shout, tell us the formula. Okay, I pro- that my German accent's probably not any better than his uh, Spanish accent. But uh, it was not the best um, I've heard, but probably on par with most other... Um, uh, attempts at Hispanic accent in old time radio without um, sounding too stereotypical. We also have an email from Paul says, uh, I wonder if you noticed a shift recently in uh, Johnny Dollar script tiles, uh, style, specifically episodes from about a month ago portrayed a Johnny Dollar who was confident early in the show, even arrogant about who uh, was the guilty party. It was sort of annoying, the character browbeat suspects based on little evidence. The last few shows, uh, for example, The Lonely Hearts uh, matter, uh, Johnny Dollar was more ambivalent throughout the show until near the end. If this rings true, thoughts on reasons for the differences in style. Um, it's tough to say. I, I will admit now that you mention it that he hasn't gone on, uh, gone off uh, in the same, uh, in the same way as he did at the start. 
Uh, the only big difference I've noted here is that towards the beginning there was more uh, scripts that were adapted from uh, E. Jack Newman uh, 30 minute scripts. Though why that would lead to uh, Johnny coming off as um, uh, arrogant um, or just too uh, sure of himself without any evidence, I'm not certain because I've listened to many of these same E. Jack Newman uh, stories and you don't get that from... um, you don't get that from most of these stories. This may have been a directive from Jack Johnstone. We'll have to see. Probably the best way to tell is if we see a series that does have him, or, or we start seeing a series of uh, programs where he does start getting overly sure early on, uh, that will probably be more indicative as to what change may have occurred. I'd assume if it's something that's uh, more or less permanent, that it was some directive from uh, uh, from Jack Johnstone, the producer um, uh, and director, uh, rather than anything specifically from the writers. But we'll see. Uh, comment from uh, iTunes review by biggest RHCP fan. I know Adam likes to hear about younger listeners. I'm 19 and listen to this daily. I've been a fan of the early uh, hard-boiled uh, crime noir detective uh, writers like Hammond and Chandler for a while now. Uh, but since I started college, I haven't had time to read extra books unrelated to school. Uh, this way, I w- still fit in my fix of crime noir while doing dishes. But I'm almost caught up, not looking forward to having to having to wait for new episodes. I only listen to the Bob Bailey ones, so I might have to check out the other ones. Also, speaking of crime noir, they steal from Hammond and Chandler, as well as uh, uh, film noir movies in these all the time. The first Bob Bailey uh, was almost the same story as Chandler's Farewell, My Lovely. And episode 1089 uh, steals chapter 2 of Hammett's Red Harvest. Everything from rich and powerful bedridden old man uh, to the physical description of the assistant. A threat to throw the detective out, the assistant knowing he's uh, not strong enough to do so. Uh, everything. Also, I'm a composer studying film scoring, and the music is fantastic. Uh, it's so great. The main theme is very dramatic, and there's lots of other great cues throughout, like uh, uh, the dreamy uh, chromatic clarinet theme. Uh, example, in episode 1089 at 2230. Keep it up, Adam. Such high-quality entertainment. I hope it never ends. Well, thanks so much for the comments. A lot to uh, talk about there. Uh, first of all, If you're really into hard-boiled detectives and you run out of this, there are two things I would definitely encourage you to uh, take a listen to. First uh, would be the Edmund O'Brien programs. Uh, O'Brien definitely very uh, hard-boiled, and you can enjoy all those episodes at archives.greatdetectives.net, particularly the first couple ones. In addition, I would also call out uh, Rogue's Gallery. Candy Matson, The Fat Man... P. Kelly's Blues, an ideal in crime uh, to meet your hard-boiled uh, needs. I'd also uh, recommend uh, Pat, Pat Novak for hire, but we're going to be doing that on the main show in a few months anyway. Um, in uh, regards to uh, Chandler and Hammett, it's no doubt, uh, I wouldn't say that they, necess- uh, that they necessarily uh, stole from Chandler and Hammett, uh, well, with some exceptions. I mean, uh, we had one episode we played of, uh, Cases of Mr. Ace, where they just out and out ripped off, uh, the Maltese Falcon. But, you know, we're all influenced by those who have, uh, come before us. And certainly they inspired quite a bit. Uh, I think I could definitely see how the McCormick matter drew on, uh, Chandler's work, even though it went a few, in a few different uh, directions. And yeah, the music is uh, great on this show. It was not quite as good in the previous uh, incarnations of Johnny Dollar, but this theme is just, uh, it's just great. So thanks so much for listening and I appreciate uh, you being out there and all the best with your studies.
All right. Well, that will do it for today. We'll be back uh, tomorrow with the final American episode of The Amazing Mr. Malone. And then we'll be back on Wednesday with the next part of The Tears of Night Matter. Uh, in the meantime, send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.